good afternoon or morning, depending upon where you're joining us from today. My name is Debbie Brenneman. I'm a partner in the Thompson Hine Labor and, and Employment Practice. Welcome to today's webinar. I am delighted to introduce two other colleagues that will be presenting with me, Scott Young and John Weimer, uh, both also partners in our Labor and Employment Group. From now until approximately 2 p.m. or shortly before, we will be reviewing issues employers need to consider as they begin to bring employ employees back into the workplace. In addition to dealing with conflicting guidance, there is no one-size-fits-all answer for most of the questions you are grappling with currently. And as you will learn as we go through our presentation, answers need to be customized for each company, giving careful consideration to location, size, industry, and even the demographics of your workforce. Due to the large audience we have on this call and the fact that we can't be helpful without fully understanding your particular situation, we are not gonna be able to take questions today that deal with specific individualized circumstances. We do encourage you to contact your Thompson Hine lawyer with any follow-up questions you may have after today's presentation. Uh, if we have time, we will try to address any general questions uh, that may be sent. So thank you again for your interest. And to begin the webinar, I'd like to turn it over to John Weimer. Thank you, Debbie, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, to those of us that have practiced law in this area for a while have, have seen businesses close and reopen under various circumstances. And so we generally know how to do it, but nobody's ever done it under circumstances like these. Uh, there's no checklist, no playbook, no guidelines, no statutes, and no court cases that cover uh, the topic of how to reopen during a business pandemic. Uh, many employers don't even know the, the issues and the questions to be addressed, much less the answers. And I say that not in any critical way at all. Uh, in fact, any employer that says it has all the answers doesn't know what the questions are, or at least what all of them are. Some basic questions that are going to apply to uh, every employer is questions like, should we reopen at all? Now, obviously, if you decide not to reopen at all, then the rest of this becomes mood and academic. But, but I would simply say that there are a lot of employers that are wrestling with that existential question of whether or not they're able to go forward period. And sadly to say, some employers that have been around a long time have made a decision that they can't go forward. Uh, and that's a tragic and unfortunate decision. The vast majority of employers, and obviously I would include all of you, have made a decision that obviously you want to reopen, and uh, you, but you want to reopen in as safe as way a possible. So the question is, when do you do it? And obviously that's going to depend to some extent on state and local shelter-in-place laws. Some states and localities permit opening sooner than other times, but whether you can open sooner than others uh, as a matter of law doesn't mean you necessarily should based on what we know now and what your overriding goal, goals are and what your business model is. One of the most immediate questions is, do we open completely or do we gradually call people back? And if we decide we're not going to bring people back to work all at one time, who do we pick to come back first and on what do we base those decisions? What do we communicate to the employees who are not being brought back immediately? What is a fair amount of notice to give? Because people that have been at home for a while doing other things might not be able to come back as quickly as we're ready to, to reopen. So what is a fair amount of notice to give? How do we give notice? Do we call people on the phone? Do we send certified letters? Do we send emails? Or is there some other methodology that we should use? Or is it all of the above? We know that there are going to be employees who say that they prefer to stay home and collect enhanced unemployment. The reason we know that is that some employers that have already announced reopenings have been told precisely that by employees who are uh, presently furloughed. What about employees who are too fearful of the health risk because they're in those high-risk groups either based on age or other co comorbidity factors? 
What about people who say, why can't I just continue working at home? And I guess overall, what is going to be the employer standard of care in terms of return to work protocols and reopenings? At the end of the, of the presentation, uh, we will talk a little bit about what some of the possible claims could be that could be brought by employees. And for that reason, I think this issue of standard of care is going to be very important on a going forward basis. But we can't provide the best answers to every particular employer until we A, know the questions, and B, understand the legal and business ramifications of those answers on your particular business. The answers, as Debbie mentioned earlier, are gonna depend a lot on where you are geographically, what your industry is, and what your structural and physical requirements are. In, in, uh, 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 relationships in terms of, is it, is it a meatpacking facility? Is it a hospital? Is it a restaurant? Is it a bank? Or, or even a law firm? Because what social distancing looks like in those settings varies greatly based on what sort of a structure or building in which you are located, or you may in some circumstances be out of doors. Everybody, as I said earlier, every employer wants to open quickly, but more important than opening quickly is every employer that I know of believes the most important thing is to open safely and doing everything that can be done to address the health of the employees who are still at work and those that will be coming back. And next to address that critically important topic is my partner, Scott Young, who is an expert on health and safety law. Scott? Uh, th thank you, John. Uh, good morning and, and good afternoon um, to everyone that's that's on and, and attending. And we have we have quite a few of you, which is which is great. Uh, and as and as John and, and as Debbie mentioned uh, before me, uh, these are definitely unprecedented times. Uh, you, you can't obviously be alive in in the United States right now and not know what everybody's dealing with in terms of the shutdowns and the, the various orders that are being issued by states and, and local municipalities in terms of how, how businesses can conduct themselves, which ones that can stay open. Um, and, and the question, some of the questions that, that we want to make sure that everybody that's in attendance is sort of is aware of uh, is, is what what should you be considering uh, as you look at reopening? Because clearly, uh, we can't be in a permanent shutdown mode. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we cannot open too quickly, uh, and then and cause more problems as as a result of that. And so, sort of questions that you would be looking at in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you reopen safely? What do you do? Is is what is the nature of your employment setting? Are you manufacturing? Are you office? Are you retail? Uh, are you sort of what, you know, as as John was mentioning, you know, how close are people in proximity to each other? Um, then you also have to look at, uh, you know, what is what is the applicable state or local order order telling you? Uh, and, and certainly they vary vastly around the country and and have put on various orders uh, in terms of you know which businesses can be open and what you can do if you if you're going to be open then sort of the the elephant in the room is is OSHA which is the federal government and, and for some some people that's you're very aware of what OSHA is and and how it applies because if you're in a manufacturing facility and uh, you know, this is this is a, an issue that you're dealing with. Um, what about conflicts between CDC and some of its guidance and what you may be hearing on television and, and, and some of these state orders? And then if you're aware of, and that's some of the things that are going to be talked about. I'm going to jump forward to some, some of the other issues and then we'll, we'll uh, as you see, I was shifting through the screen, so we'll go back and pick, uh, pick Scott up once we go through this. Uh, there are a lot of logistical considerations with regard to reopening. Um, first, of course, as Scott mentioned, you have a variety of state and local orders, which, which vary widely, uh, which sometimes, uh, as we've seen in Ohio, uh, continue to change. I think we saw three or four iterations of uh, 
reopening uh, guidelines within the course of four days. Uh, and they're going to impose a lot of requirements on you uh, to begin with, uh, requirements such as social distancing, barriers, facial coverings, uh, sanitizing, so a lot of things that, that are going to be required of you. Uh, beyond that, of course, there are things that you may want to consider on your own uh, with regard to both mandatory social distancing and other safety and health concerns. Uh, you may want to consider reconfiguring if you have a cubicle situation, uh, perhaps only have a limited number of people uh, in those cubicles and consider uh, some staggered schedule. Everybody. Uh, perhaps. They, oh, there you go. I see your phone's connected again. Scott? Yes, I am back. There seems to have been an issue with my audio. I apologize about all of that. Uh, so, not sure where I was when, when people when I when I dropped off on the audio, but if we could go to the OSHA general duty clause slide. Hello? Yes, I'll return oh. to the slide. Uh, can can we back up? It's it's slide number six. Okay, so from, from where I was going or attempting to talk about earlier with respect to the OSHA's general duty clause uh, is under OSHA's general duty clause and what I was, and I don't know if I got cut off before I said this, but uh, in essence, one of the things that we, that the, the, the questions that we have are what about conflicts between CDC, OSHA and state orders? How do you reconcile those? That is one of the frequently asked questions on the OSHA DOL website. And in essence, OSHA operates according to the, to the federal statutes and passed by Congress. And so ideally, uh, one will be able to reconcile what is set forth in the OSHA codes and the CDC and the applicable state orders. Uh, but in the event that this is not possible, then as far as employers are concerned, OSHA does does govern and provide the minimum mand mandatory standards. As John and Debbie will also be talking about, sometimes you may have issues where you're trying to reconcile what is in the CFR for OSHA and some of the other uh, regulations that may be applying uh, applied to Title VII and, and ADA and, and those sorts of condi conditions or considerations. From an, from an OSHA general duty clause perspective, uh, it does require that each employer shall furnish to each of its employees employment and a place of employment that are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to its employees. So what does that mean? It means that while there are a set of occupational and safety and health standards that everyone needs to, needs to follow, uh, there is also a general duty clause that also places a burden upon employers or an obligation upon employers to, in essence, in this case, um, based upon the science as we may know about it with respect to COVID-19, to keep employees safe. And that's where the what the CDC and the various health experts make publicly known to all of us, um, that is relevant to how we may then attempt to comply with our, with our legal obligations. Uh, next slide. And so from that vantage point, it's important to have an understanding as to how COVID-19 is spread. We have to have that basic understanding in order to know, well, how are we going to keep ourselves safe? How are we going to, uh, in essence, if as we reopen, ensure that we we stay open and and we don't have outbreaks and and other issues that that may simply be bad for all of us from a societal standpoint and certainly from an employment liability standpoint. So what is on this slide is is basically how COVID-19 is spread based upon what we know. Um, there are there is guidance 
base put out both by the Department of Labor on, and the CDC with respect to this. And what we know is that COVID-19 spreads by person-to-person -person transmission during close within six feet contact um, and primarily from respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs or sneezed. Um, they could also be infected with COVID-19 uh, by touching surfaces or objects that have been contaminated with the virus. So in other words, if somebody touches a doorknob, touches uh, a Xerox copier, touches a telephone, and that individual had COVID-19, uh, uh, that can be spread to those objects and that can be on that object and be viable for hours to days, depending upon the, on the surface. Uh, next slide. Um, from an OSHA standpoint, in terms of a recommended best practice, they are recommending that, that, and this is in line with many of the state orders that are coming out, that, that you frequently wash hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Um, you avoid touching eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed hands. You practice good respiratory technique, including coughs and sneezes. Uh, you avoid close contact with people who are sick or without appropriate personal protective equipment. And I'll get into what that means in a minute. Um, stay home if you're sick, monitor for fever, take your temperature uh, if you have any of the symptoms of COVID-19. Also know personal risk factors for complications from COVID-19. Uh, next slide. And that is important because as an employer, uh, you're obligated not just with respect to having a workplace that is safe for a healthy individual with no pre-existing pre conditions, but also with respect to people, to the extent that you know about the situation, and certainly you may not know, but you certainly need to be aware of what the risk factors are for serious complications of COVID-19, and also be aware that if you have individuals that work for you, that you know have any of these conditions, and, and again, you may not know because of privacy concerns, but if you do know, uh, then you are going to be expected to have under OSHA regulations, a heightened obligation to ensure their safety as well. And so that's going to include people with heart or lung disease, diabetes, moderate to severe asthma, uh, immune diseases, cancer, smoking, uh, Severe obesity is another cause, uh, chronic liver disease, and, and chronic kidney disease. Um, and so those are just things to be aware of. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of looking at your own employment setting and, and what, what you should do, you should assess the risk of COVID-19 exposure in your own setting. Are you a very high exposure risk? Are you a high exposure risk, a medium exposure risk, or a lower exposure risk? Next slide. Very high exposure risk jobs include jobs with a very high potential for exposure to, to known or suspected sources of, of the SARS COVID uh, virus. Um, normally or typically, it's going to be individuals that work in the health profession that are specifically per, uh, treating known individuals um, or individuals that, that are believed to have the COVID virus. Um, high exposure risk people are people that may primarily work in mortuaries or work in health settings that may not be necessarily specifically treating individuals with, with COVID-19, but certainly there's a reasonable expectation that they're going to be people with that condition in their employment environment. Uh, next slide. Most of us fall or most employers fall in the medium exposure risk or the lower exposure risk. Uh, medium exposure risk jobs are basically jobs that require frequent close contact with people who may be infected but you don't know. Um, and then lower exposure risk jobs, meaning there is no no exposure risk job per se, at least according to DOL guidance. Um, but lower exposure risk jobs would be jobs that, that really don't require any contact with people known to be or suspected of being infected with, with COVID-19. Um, next slide. Um, according to OSHA, workers who may be at increased risk of exposure of COVID-19, which would be in the very high, high, or medium levels, um, would be healthcare workers, morgue and mortuary workers, high population density work environments, 
uh, research and production laboratory workers, airline retail operations, uh, particularly high customer volume environments, uh, solid waste and wastewater management, environmental services, janitorial, uh, it, travel to areas where the virus is spreading. Uh, th that's what I have on this slide is not a, a comprehensive or full list. It is a list of company or areas that have been specifically identified. But as I will get into, uh, employers are required and are obligated to conduct a thorough hazard assessment of their existing employment operation to determine which category they may fit in and what they may need to do. Uh, next slide. Um, and in terms of, okay, you need to do something. What, what sort of things should we be considering in terms of doing? Um, from that vantage point, from what OSHA has come out with uh, and is consistent as well within its various code of federal regulations are to consider engineering controls, administrative controls, personal protective equipment, again, a loaded word, which I'll get to on another slide, and then training. Um, next slide. It, engineering controls considerations would include physical barriers, uh, ventilation, isolation rooms, rope and stanchion systems. Ba basically, you put up a rope and, and, and you attempt to keep people away from each other. And, and you certainly may see that in, in certain retail or store environments. Signage, lots of signage um, in, in terms of assisting to maintain the six feet or more away from others. Or certainly other options from an engineering standpoint to consider, but these, these are things that you should definitely consider because while at this point in time, we're certainly sort of in the infancy of the first couple of months of COVID-19 or first few months of COVID-19 being a big issue in this country, um, as companies begin to reopen, which we all should, but we should try to do safely, um, making sure that you have the right engineering controls, the administrative controls and the other items in place uh, is, is the best avenue for mitigating and reducing the risk, certainly of 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 the exposure to to others from sort of a, a human standpoint, but also from a from an employer liability standpoint. Uh, next slide. Uh, from an administrative con control standpoint, some of the things that you should be thinking about are you know, what are our safety rules? Do we have safety rules that govern specifically COVID-19? Should we? I'm going to tell you that you should. Um, and do you enforce them? You should. Uh, do, do we have policies in, in place that reduce contacts by multiple individuals to the same phone supplies and work areas? Is that reasonably feasible? Um, do you have a policy for disinfecting frequency for work areas and items with, with an anticipated common contact? Uh, do note, with respect to that and the disinfection that there's actually a, a, a sanitation standard uh, in 29 CFR 1910. Um, so it's, it's not just a CDC state recommended practice. Um, it's actually a federal requirement as well. Um, adjust work schedules to reduce crowding, adjust break schedules to reduce crowding. Um, there's certainly other things, but administrative controls would be processes and procedures as an employer that you may be able to implement if you can't do engineering. Because certainly the best way to handle a work safe environment would be, can you do engineering? Engineering is, you can put up the signage, but but it may not be feasible to add ventilation or, or do some of the other things. And so you wanna make sure that you've got administrative controls in place. Um, next, next slide. The next thing is personal protective equipment. Uh, you know, and personal protective equipment, there, there is an OSHA standard with respect to that. And one of the things to keep in mind with personal protective equipment is, you know, PPE is something that is intended to, to prevent or protect an individual that's wearing it from some other hazardous environment. So from that vantage point, um, a, a face covering, what is a face mask, certain, certain things may be designed to prevent somebody else from getting it. That would not be PPE under the, under the OSHA standard. But if it is PPE, if it is something that you should be providing to someone to protect themselves, 
Um, there is a standard that, that governs all of that. And it is something as an employer that you are obligated to make available and provide to employees and if, if necessary to protect them to require that they that that they wear it. Um, certainly in terms of PPE, you have both what the federal requirements are and then certainly across the country you have state or local orders that are coming into play and 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 one of the things to be mindful with those is you know is is what the state or local order are they is it PPE such that certain OSHA uh, regulations would then be triggered in terms of what we would need to do such as training and and providing it to them or is it not really PPE is it really something else and, and so that that's just a question that you should be aware of uh, next slide um, and from a from a PPE hazard assessment, um, employers are required to conduct a hazard assessment to make appropriate PPE equipment selection if necessary. You need to train on how to use eye and face protection, hand protection, respiratory protection. And so just to be aware that if you find that you have employees that are within six feet of each other, um, that that there are certain obligations that are therefore going to be triggered that you're going to need to consider as to whether or not PPE is required and then what, what you're required to do if you're going to provide it to them. Uh, next slide. Um, respiratory protection. What is a respirator? Um, that's certainly a kind of PPE, uh, but this is something that's, that's important to note, is a respirator is something that's designed to prevent the wearer from from in this case COVID-19 um, and so that would be an N95 mask as an example. Um, note that a, a face covering or a mask that isn't sufficient to do that may not then be a respirator and why is this important? Next slide. Because if it is a respirator that is governed by the OSHA standards and that would be if somebody you're going to provide everybody in 95 masks, um, then you're required to have a written respiratory program. You, there's a retraining requirement. There's a medical evaluation that's required um, and there's fit testing. And this is this is federal law. And so even though there may be recommendations by state or local governments to do some of these things, if they if they rise to the standard of requiring you to have respiratory protection, then this is going to be triggered whether or not the state or local order is otherwise directing that you do it. Uh, next slide. And then what if what if an employee shows up and brings their own PPE? Um, well, there are there are employment obligations triggered as well. You're responsible for ensuring that it's adequate. You're you're responsible for ensuring that it's maintained properly and sanitized, even if it's not yours. Um, and if it is a legitimate respiratory uh, mask, then there's a disclosure document and you also need the written respiratory program as well. Uh, next slide. Um, additionally, the OSHA standards as well, and this is going to apply to all of us, is there is an obligation to, since we're dealing with this pandemic, that, that, you, that you train employees on the anticipated occupational exposure to COVID-19. As you bring people back, that is a legal obligation. Um, to, to the extent the PPE is required, th there, there is training requirements for that, among other requirements. Um, this needs to be offered during scheduled work hours and at no cost to the employee. Now, this doesn't need to be overblown or overcomplicated, but, but it's something that you need to have. And certainly, if you end up with, with COVID-19 cases six months down the road or whenever it is as we reopen, you want to make sure that if anybody's looking, that you've done these things. It goes back to what John had been talking about with respect to standard of care. Uh, next slide. Um, and if there's an employee report of COVID-19, just note the state obligations as applicable. Note the OSHA obligations and ADA, ADA privacy concerns with respect to what you can and cannot disclose. Um, also know that if you have an employee that reports COVID-19, that ultimately it's probably a record you're going to need to maintain. And it's, and it's going to be, and that's required by the CFR, because it's going to be something that would be reasonably potentially relevant to somebody else who may have COVID-19 as to whether or not the exposure was at work. Uh, next slide. 
Um, there are reporting obligations, certainly. If you have an employee that has COVID-19, uh, note the OSHA requirement that, that, uh, that if it's a work-related uh, situation, which is obviously another whole loaded question, um, if there was a fatality, it must be reported within eight hours to OSHA and within 24 hours if there's an inpatient hospitalization. Uh, next slide. And then there are a whole host of COVID-19 related claims if you don't meet the standard care. And, and, and John and Debbie will talk about some of the other ones. Um, certainly on this slide, workers' comp, employer intentional tort, if you're beyond negligent. Uh, certainly the customer and third party actions based upon theories of negligence, premises liability and tort. OSHA certainly can enforce its, its violation or its, its codes and issues, issue fines and, and directives to correct. Certainly if an employee feels that you have an unsafe workplace from a COVID-19 perspective, that can result in a whistleblower claim to OSHA. Certainly you've got the state law violations and, and their safety requirements and then other employment issues. And, and I think at this point, I'll turn it over to Debbie. Thank you, Scott. And certainly that potential for a variety of claims just underscores the need to make sure that your reopening is thoughtful and that you are considering a variety of logistical uh, and other considerations. And I'll jump back into what we started talking about when we lost Scott a little earlier. Uh, but you may want to, beyond what is required of you, uh, think about how you might reconfigure or limit your facility to better protect uh, the health of your employees and better uh, limit your potential risk. So you might consider what are you going to do with your common areas? Are you going to close them? Uh, break rooms and lunch rooms? Are you going to restrict them to a certain number of people? Um, being mindful of state uh, state law requirements in terms of gatherings, uh, perhaps. Uh, so how are you going to handle those? What about restroom areas? Again, do you want to limit those to a certain number of people? Uh, what kind of signage are you going to put up? What about meetings when you're coming back into the office? Are you going to uh, have meetings or are you going to try to do those remotely uh, to the extent that, that that's feasible, even if people may be back in the office? So think about those types of things. Um, and I would also encourage you as you're going down this path to think about um, providing uh, or making documentation uh, of these various steps that you're, you're taking. Um, going, uh, touching on the enhanced cleaning and sanitation, for example, Who's going to be responsible for doing that at what times of the day? And should you keep a log of that so that if you have a, a later claim that you weren't doing enough to protect your workforce or, or your clients or customers, uh, you have that backup. Just as when you're in, a, in many areas of employment law, you hear employment lawyers saying document, document, document. I think as this unfolds, it's going to be another area where you want to consider documenting what you've done, what training you've, you, you, you've shared, uh, those sorts of things. What about if you are an employer who is doing a gradual reopening? You're not just opening your doors all at once for everybody uh, to come in. Again, a number of things that you need to be thinking about. Uh, for uh, many employers may be thinking about a reduced schedule reopening. You're going to, you want to bring employees back on a part-time basis. Take a moment to think if that's the best approach for the employees because if they are, uh, you know, they may be, uh, may well be getting unemployment compensation right now. If they come in on a reduced schedule, uh, depending upon your state, that certainly uh, is going to impact the amount of uh, unemployment compensation that they might be able to receive. So they may end up making less coming back part time uh, than they would be on uh, unemployment. So think about whether, you know, are you going to bring people back across the board on a reduced schedule, or maybe do you bring some people back first? Uh, and allow others to stay out on unemployment. If that's the approach you're going to take, you need to be very thoughtful about who does come back first to make sure you're not, uh, it doesn't appear that a protected classification is having a disparate impact in terms of their return to work. Of course, with all of this, if you are an employer who has received a PPP loan, you're going to be uh, need to be uh, also considering your um, salary basis uh, so that you don't run into any forgiveness issues. Certainly, uh, many employers are wrestling with continuation of telework for employees that that's realistic for. So you want to be thoughtful about how are you going to approach that. There may be many employees who do want to continue to telework. How do you address that? How do you address that on a consistent basis? Beyond the ADA issues that we're going to talk about in a moment, some states do require uh, 
uh, that you provide um, uh, certain arrangements for folks who are in a vulnerable classification, those high-risk categories. So there may be areas where you must consider some continuation of telework. So that's something to, to wrestle with. And again, make sure you're addressing on a consistent basis. A couple of things with regard to your exempt employees. Many employers through this have looked at salary reductions for exempt employees, and many employers may continue to look at that. So of course, you want to make sure you're staying within the threshold requirements for that or risk possible uh, loss to the exempt status. But one thing that hasn't been discussed as much is what about as you bring folks back, what if your managers are chipping in and doing some of the, uh, the line work that other employees may typically do? Be careful of that because that could threaten uh, exempt status as well. Uh, if you know, if someone who falls within the the, uh, the executive exclusion or the administrative administrative uh, exclusion, uh, their duties have to be consistent with that. They must be primarily engaging in uh, managerial type duties. So if they are all of a sudden being thrust into just helping keep the business run, you may be looking at some uh, threat to exempt classification at least for a period of time. So be mindful of that. Now, what about testing of your employees uh, as folks come back? Uh, again, many state and local orders have specific requirements about uh, this. Employers are doing uh, testing or assessments in a number of different ways. Some employers are using self-assessments, requiring empl employees to uh, take their temperatures at home or provide verification as they come in every day that they don't have the symptoms that have been identified, that they have a temperature below a certain threshold, et cetera. Some employers are actually taking temperatures as em employees report to work. Um, and there's some question about, does that become compensable time? Uh, and the answer, again, is it depends. It probably depends upon the jurisdiction. It probably depends upon what method is used. It may depend upon how long that takes uh, through the process. Is that you know, more than de minimis time utilizing that? So something that you must consider as you're assessing what kind of uh, testing will you be requiring? Interestingly, um, well, the next uh, slide will address this as well, uh, but the EEOC at least is taking the position that you as employers may be actually able to uh, require medical testing, require uh, COVID-19 tests. So you need to assess if that's something that's appropriate for you. And certainly with regard to testing, don't, don't forget about the third parties that you utilize, such as staffing agencies, temp agencies, other vendors that come into your workplace. You should be confirming with, with those third parties that, that they are also following the guidelines and protocol that you are using for your own employees. Otherwise, again, you create that potential risk uh, that you do not necessarily need to incur. With regard to COVID-19 testing, uh, new EEOC guidance addresses this on uh, again, the direct threat basis, that you as an employer have a right to prevent uh, a direct threat to your employees uh, by allowing an individual to come into the workplace uh, that may be positive for COVID-19 uh, during the circumstances of this pandemic. So the EEOC guidance says you may choose to administer COVID-19 tests to employees. Uh, it's not clear on how frequent the EEOC is, is suggesting that that might occur. Is that as you reopen a uh, one-time only thing? Is that on a weekly basis? Is that something that occurs when an employee has been out for a period of time? Uh, that's all unclear, but what the EEOC does say is if you're going to go down this road, you need to make sure that the tests you are using are accurate and, and reliable. And to do so, you should consult what the CDC, the FDA are referring to as appropriate tests and it doesn't eliminate the need for your other infection control strategies. Now, with regard to all of this testing, uh, make sure uh, that if you're, you're collecting self-assessments, you're collecting temperature logs, uh, you're doing any kind of, of test, you do maintain the confidentiality of that information by putting it in the separate medical file and keeping it that way. Uh, there are some, uh, the EEOC says that you may uh, be able to disclose this information, uh, if an employee te does test positive for COVID-19, that it may be appropriate to disclose to public health authorities. But again, there may be local or state uh, parameters on there that, uh, on, on that disclosure that you want to consider as well. Let's talk about a few other return to work issues. We referenced before, there are a variety of, variety of scenarios you're going to face. Uh, if the employee is just afraid to come to work, are they concerned because 
they may be in a high risk category, have they been actually advised by a healthcare provider to continue to quarantine? These are the real issues that you're going to be wrestling with. Um, employees who refuse to come to work, and, and Scott or John referenced this earlier, and I'm talking now not about employees who maybe ha may have ADA issues, not talking about employees who uh, are uh, in high risk categories uh, necessarily, but just people who say, I'm afraid, I think it's too early to come back, I'm not coming back. Um, in this scenario, the paid sick leave under the federal st new federal statute is not available. You and as an employer may have PTO options that the employees may be able to utilize. This would be a good time to uh, revisit your policies and specifically address whether you want uh, PTO to be used in this situation or not used. Um, you may choose to put the person on unpaid administrative leave. Um, some employers are terminating employees who refuse to come back to work. As with everything COVID-19, I think this is a tread lightly area that you really need to consult with counsel and, and look at the uh, particular circumstances. Again, if the person is does have a vulnerability, that may change the game uh, with regard to what you can do. And there are also an increasing number of states if you do have employees just are afraid to come to work. Uh, there are an increasing number of states, including Ohio now, uh, that does have notification. I won't say necessarily, some are recommendations, some are requirements, that if an employee uh, uh, is deemed to have voluntarily uh, resigned by not coming into work, that there are notification forms for providing that information to the state uh, so they do not uh, continue to receive unemployment in the event that they've just chosen not to report back to work. There are also going to be ADA accommodation issues. So if employees have a disability that does put them at a greater risk from COVID-19, um, they come to you and say, hey, because of this high risk, I think I have a disability, I'd like to, you know, I, I need an accommodation, or even if they don't say it expressly, uh, if they, you may be required to provide that accommodation of continuing to work from home. If their uh, job does not permit working from home, then that may look like unpaid leave or leave otherwise consistent with your policies. Um, or it could be as simple, and the EEOC guidance actually identifies this, as providing some other types of personal protection. So putting up uh, barriers in the workplace, providing them with facial coverings or gloves uh, that may be appropriate. In fact, the EEOC has said that there may be a lot of low-cost solutions that may be able to provide accommodations for those who need to have reduced contact. It doesn't have to be something fancy in many circumstances. It can be something uh, that, is, that is a very affordable solution. Um, there are also, I know we've been advising folks who have come forward and said, well, I, you know, I'm stressed. I can't come to work because I'm stressed uh, or I'm very anxious about uh, the COVID-19 situation or getting it. Well, just that would not trigger ADA accommodations issues. But if you do have an employee who has a pre-existing mental illness, such as anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, those types of underlying pre-existing mental illness uh, that's been exacerbated by the pandemic may well be entitled to ADA accommodations. Now the EEOC says, of course, you can engage in that interactive dialogue and, and uh, ask for documentation and certification to support uh, that request, but the EEOC also emphasizes that you should be flexible because right now it may be very difficult uh, to be able to get those doctor's notes and, and so forth in any kind of timely basis. Interestingly, um, as many of you know, in terms of ADA accommodations, the undue hardship uh, showing has always been extremely difficult. That has changed with regard to the pandemic. So the EEOC is expressly recognizing that there may be um, things that might not have been an undue hardship before, certainly may be an undue hardship now uh, that might excuse uh, an accommodation, a reasonable accommodation. And that includes if your revenue stream has decreased dr dramatically because of the pandemic, if there's a piece of equipment uh, that you uh, th that an employee may need that it's going to be difficult to obtain in a timely basis. So th the undue hardship uh, analysis would certainly be a lot easier to reach in this environment than it has previously in the past. And just one more note with regard to accommodations, and Scott talked about um, the masks and other personal uh, protective equipment. The EEOC does say that there may be situations where an employee with a disability needs an accommodation. So non-latex gloves, perhaps, 
uh, modified face masks if you have people who need to, uh, you know, lip read, um, gowns uh, designed for individuals who use wheelchairs or even religious accommodations uh, that you may need to make. So these are all going to be very individualized requests and analysis uh, as we navigate these waters ahead. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to John. Thank you, Debbie. Well, I'm going to cover uh, three more points before we conclude. The first one is uh, reopening with union represented employees. And if you're if you're dealing with with a union or in some com companies' cases multiple unions, uh, before you reopen, you certainly want to look at the collective bargaining agreement because that's where it always starts and sometimes where it always ends including any memorandum of understanding and past practices. Although, as mentioned at the outset, the, the likelihood that this has ever been addressed anywhere uh, it, with any specificity is extremely uh, unlikely. But, but look at that and decide what your rights are in terms of making decisions to reopen without the involvement of the union. I'm going to talk about union involvement in a minute. But determine whether or not you have the right uh, to 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 go ahead and, and reopen uh, in the absence of any sort of bargaining with the union. Also, be aware, uh, be aware of the fact that there's been a recent NLRB case that has uh, adopted what's called the contract coverage rule, which says if the contract mentions a topic, then what that means is that the parties have bargained to whatever extent they were obligated to bargain, and the employer is free to move forward with whatever actions it deems appropriate. Uh, usually there's management rights language that helps the employer uh, in terms of giving it rights to to make changes and to do things along the lines that we have we have talked about uh, so determine that first but regardless of whether you think you have the right to proceed without union involvement you should not do that you should always partner with the union if you're going to to reopen and and it's really important to make sure that the union understands that you are working with them as a partner, but you're not going to bargain over that. And I strongly encourage employers to get the union to, to participate in this process and to even solicit suggestions from the union as to what it thinks are the most important steps to ensure uh, the safety of the employees and to ensure the safety of its bargaining unit members. You don't want to be in a position where the union says, well, they never ask us what we thought uh, or that we would have made suggestions, but we never had an opportunity. So you want this to be a true partnership with everybody working uh, in the, uh, together in the same direction, which to, is to achieve a successful business reopening, but also, and more importantly, a safe one. The biggest sticking point based on the preliminary uh, returns with a union is going to be the issue of employee safety. And the union, if they're going to, to balk at anything, they're going to say it's too early, uh, there's too big of a risk. And that, frankly, of course, is not uh, a union issue, not anything you have to bargain about. If you make the business judgment that it's not too risky to reopen and that for the necessity of the success and, and frankly, the continued viability of your business, you have to reopen, then that's not something to bargain over. The only thing you would want to bargain over with the union is how to do it safely. But at the end of the day, that will be an employer determination. And keep in mind the old adage of labor relations, which is that unless an employee has a reasonable good faith belief that performing a particular task or assignment is likely to expose that employee to a high risk of serious harm, then the rule is obey now, grieve later. And you hopefully you won't have to get to that point, but keep keep in mind that an employee can't say, well, I just I just don't think it's safe. They have to have an objective, reasonable, good faith belief that it is a serious risk of harm, and that's going to be a difficult standard, I think, for most employees to, to, to establish, most union-represented employees, particularly if we go through 
these various protocols that we have been uh, discussing up to this point. Next slide uh, is a discussion of the claims that employee, employees are most likely to file. And I guess the imagination is almost limitless as to what you could be sued for as a result of all of this. Uh, but some very likely claims, in fact, some that have already started to be filed, would include retaliation uh, under the uh, Families First Coronavirus Re uh, Response Act or some other violation for, of FMLA or the expanded uh, FMLA. That's always a possibility. Uh, another possibility, a good possibility, are wage payment claims. Uh, including overtime, worked at home, uh, or as Debbie mentioned, employees saying that they were required to perform non-exempt work and should have been paid overtime. Something to think about, uh, consistent with what Debbie and Scott mentioned earlier, is if you are going to require employees be tested, at least have their temperature taken, or and or to complete a brief questionnaire, that discusses where they've been, who they might have been exposed to, whether they've had a dry cough, whether anybody in their family has, whether or not that is should be compensable time. In my view, the last thing we probably need in this reopening context is a dispute over that. And hopefully you can come up with a streamlined procedure so that if you do treat it as compensable time, and I would I would be inclined to do that, uh, that it won't, we won't be talking about a lot of time or money, but, but be prepared for the fact that employees will want to be compensated, expect to be compensated for periods of time where they're responding to questionnaires, having their temperature taken, and the data recorded before they can proceed uh, to work. We're also seeing claims brought under the Worker Adjustment and Reunification Act, or uh, uh, Readjustment Notification Act, uh, because what was originally thought to be Short term might be a long term loss of employment. Keep in mind that a job loss includes any loss of work that lasts more than six months. And we are starting to get to a point in time where I think employers, if you haven't already given what I call a conditional or contingent war notice, you might want to consider giving one now if it looks like some people may be out of work for at least six months or some people may not be coming back at all assuming that the WARN Act thresholds in terms of numbers and percentages uh, have been met. Uh, there are cases that have already been brought regarding failure to give the proper COBRA notice for COBRA eligibility. So be aware of that. If you have a third party administrator that does that for you, make sure that they're issuing those notices when people are put out of work, even if it's temporary. Uh, you may also have uh, HIPAA issues that can, can arise based on how you uh, what you do with the data. And as Scott mentioned, you want to keep that information separate. For example, even somebody's temperature and any any survey or medical uh, survey information kept in a medical file and not in a personnel file. You may find uh, yourself the uh, subject of a discrimination claim, uh, either brought by people who have been furloughed or by people who have not been recalled from furlough Obviously, whoever, however you made the decision to lay people off, to furlough them, it should be the same criterion that's applied in bring, bringing people uh, back to work. As Scott mentioned, there may be workers' compensation claims. Um, frankly, when you consider the alternatives, maybe workers' compensation claims are not the worst thing uh, to, that you can uh, imagine. Uh, of course, they have to show that they contracted the illness at work some people think that will be hard for claimants to do. I tend to think it'll be relatively easy because the claimant will say, listen, all I did was shelter in place. The only time I went anywhere was to go to work. So I must have gotten it there. And the way the workers' compensation system works, I suspect that'll probably be a, a successful argument. But, uh, and keep in mind, of course, it's, it's not a negligence uh, dependent claim. So even if you do everything right, that's always a, a possibility. Uh, there could be private claims for failure to provide a safe work environment, uh, as well as claims for fraud or misrepresentation. Employees say, well, they told me they would bring me back and they didn't. Uh, I could have gotten another job and I didn't, or I was offered another job and I didn't take it. Uh, 
So I'm hoping that when you furloughed people, you, no representations were made as to if or when they would be recalled, and simply uh, what you communi to, communicated to them was aspirational as in nature as opposed to be something that could be considered a, an enforceable promise or a fraudulent uh, misrepresentation. And then the last thing that I would like to talk about are the employee relations considerations. These are not all legally legal related, but I think they're really important as you try to reopen and do so in the most effective and efficient and safe means possible. Uh, keep in mind that in uncertain times, and we are in the most uncertain of times, no news can be worse than bad news. So. Communication is key, I think, ongoing and regular communication. Even if there's nothing new to report, maintaining contact with your workforce is vital. One thing I strongly encourage every employer to do is to assign someone with the necessary experience and expertise to take overall responsibility and accountability for overseeing this return to work program including communications. Some companies have a task force. Some have simply an individual designated for overall responsibility. But it seems to me that there needs to be a small group of people or one group that is accountable for uh, dealing with these questions and answering these questions and monitoring the situation on an ongoing basis. One thing that is not in the slides that I should have put in, but let me add this, and if you're making notes, taking notes, I suggest you do that. And that is to remember that communications are a two-way street. We're not only going to communicate to our employees, we need them to communicate to us. One thing I encourage you to consider doing is establishing some sort of health and safety hotline so that employees can notify you, this either this task force or this individual, uh, individual or his or her office, about any safety concerns that they see on the job and to actually have an opportunity to make rec uh, recommendations and suggestions for things that could be done to improve health and safety. You might or might not decide they're a good idea, but why not get the maximum amount of feedback and information you can uh, as you go forward, as opposed to just making decisions in isolation. And of course, part of this hotline would include an assurance against retaliation and keeping track of these reports, what was recommended, what was reported, and what action you took. By doing this, of course, you always run the risk of a whistleblower complaint that somebody says, well, I complained about safety and health and they didn't do anything. We know that employees are going to complain about it, so I'd rather have them have a set procedure and a set protocol to report these concerns as opposed to them saying, well, I said that something to my supervisor and he or she ignored me and then they fired me, so I must be a whistleblower. So I strongly encourage that you do that. Uh, keep in mind that none of us are going to get it right 100% the first time and I think fle flexibility, uh, the ability to adjust with new data and new information that would include information from employees who are being brought back to work will be critical. And then the last thing I would say, and I mentioned this at the outset about uh, um, a standard of care, uh, you know, I think good faith results will be the best defense we can possibly have uh, to these, to these uh, claims. Um, for example, one of the questions that's come up is, you know, should, are, are we required to take employees, returning employees temperatures? The answer is there's no requirement that you do it. But to me, that's going to be a standard of care. Did you take this people's temperatures? Well, no, we weren't required to. Well, if there's a problem arising out of that, then I think that could be a problem for us. So I hope that's helpful. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Debbie. Thank you, John. And we have run up against the end of our hour. Uh, if you do have questions after today's webinar, please email or call your regular Thompson Hine lawyer who will direct you to a member of our COVID-19 task force. If you are not a current Thompson Hine client, you can contact one of us and we, we can discuss with you options to address your needs. If you are not currently receiving our updates and invitations, we do invite you to visit the Thompson Hine website and to register to receive our mailings under the Publications tab. I will note the presentation today was being recorded uh, and the, uh, both the presentation and the PowerPoint will be available uh, on the website as well.
We issue regular updates on a variety of topics, including the coronavirus, uh, so let us know if you'd like to join that mailing list. Thank you again all for your interest and for attending today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day and our sincere wishes that you and your families stay well. Thank you.